Okay, uh, thank you, Michael and Thomas, for, for arranging this. Always like to come here and looking at the nice small audience, uh, I see pretty much everybody's an expert, so this is cool. Um, yeah. So uh, interrupt me anytime. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll be showing sort of some highlights in, in uh, some of our group's work on uh, simulating uh, spin dynamics and some equilibrium, older equilibrium um, systems with trapped ions. So the idea here, at least everything I'll talk about, the, the system here, uh, each, each ion encodes a spin. And as you'll see, uh, a little bit of background, I think some of the other uh, lectures will talk about the same system. We can um, we can uh, make a spin-spin interaction through optical forces, uh, and I'll be talking lots about uh, some of the studies of you know, spin orders that we can observe in the system and so forth. And the main body aspect, of course, is that these these will be for small chains anyway. These are fully connected icing chains, so uh, the many body fit is sort of obvious there. Um, and uh, uh, when you have non-commuting terms with a Hamiltonian, an icing model, plus say a transverse field, or maybe an XY model, the dynamics is pretty complex, and you know, many body physics is, um, well, yeah, there's, uh, let me put it this way, I, th I think um, a lot of us, at least me, uh, I'm a, now a student in condensed matter, learning all these different types of models and, and, and things like thermalization, why it happens, and in some cases, how it doesn't happen uh, in, a, in a closed system, what that even means. Um, and yeah, anyway, it's been, it's been pretty exciting. It's not exactly quantum computing, although a lot of the <laughs> techniques here, uh, the same laboratory can be used for gate models to, to do algorithms and so forth. So with that, with that kind of <laughs> incoherent introduction, uh, so uh, I'm going to show data from several separate systems. This is this is one of our most advanced. You'll recognize that's the HOA, High Optical Access Trap from Sandia, uh, where we can hold lots of ions in a linear chain and optically address them. Uh, I'll show data from other traps as well, but they're all linear ion traps. Um, and I'll, I'll actually show some some results from, from INQ. They're more interested in quantum computing, but uh, they've been uh, performing variational quantum eigen solvers in certain cases, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so you've all seen these intro, intro slides before. Our effective spin are the clock pair of states in the Interbium 171 um, <coughs> atom. Uh, F equals 1, 0, and F equals, uh, F equals uh, 0, M F equals 0 states. <coughs> and the hyperfine splitting is 12.6 gigahertz. And I guess the, you've heard me say this before, I think the reason we use euterbium is that the lasers that are ideally suited to drive these transitions are very clean lasers. Very well engineered, you can buy them, and they only have one adjustable parameter, it's the on-off on button, which is kind of, it's, it's nice to have that, so you don't have to, we can think about uh, uh, spin chains instead of lasers. Uh, now there are CW lasers involved, of course, those are always getting easier, they're all fiber delivered, but uh, this is the workhorse for all of the, um, what generates the icing interaction and anything coherent. Now it's a Mohawk laser, um, it has a bandwidth uh, about 10 times this, about 100 gigahertz. Um, and because it's, a, uh, because it's a 100 megahertz rep rate, we have about 1,000 comb teeth and every comb tooth, and it's, if we had exactly 100 megahertz, every comb tooth and it's 126 neighbor would drive a coherent Raman transition and we get to coherently sum all of them. Now that means we need to control this rep rate. That's certainly true. Is the rep rate tunable? Ah, yes. So, yes, uh, the first lie of the day. Um, we actually have to do open heart surgery to that thing to, to control the rep rate. Now, but that uh, we we do that to get um, to push down an AC start shift fluctuating AC start shift error below one percent. If you're happy with ninety nine percent operation, in which we are in, in many cases, we don't need to tune this at all because we're going to be driving counter-propagating Raman transitions since we have two cones and we can offset one with respect to the other. So as long as the, the rep rate doesn't drift too much, and even if it does drift, you can feed forward to the offset of the other cone. Take that into account. We call it a feed forward. It's not really a feedback. But uh, as I said, uh, the problem is as the rep rate drifts, um, off-resonant uh, interactions that are uh, maybe 50 megahertz away in the nearest cone Tooth can drive start shifts that fluctuate. So it's sort of a higher effect, Howard effect. If you want three nines, you really have to control the rep rate. We've done that. In fact, um, 
I didn't want to talk too much about this. The company Coherent, it's, it's um, actually in Lübeck, northern Germany. Um, uh, it was a company bought out by Coherent, and uh, it took them about a half a year to tell us that they would not be willing to open it up and do it themselves, but they showed us how. We signed NDAs and everything. They opened up the laser and showed it, and lent us tools to do it. So we, we, we have modified three of these so far, and it just worked perfectly. It's a triple DAG laser, and we actually much took the output coupler of the oscillator out of there and replaced it with our own on a, on a translation station. It works just beautifully. So we do have control of the, uh, of the uh, uh, particular record and we can stabilize it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a very high level view of how we generate this icing interaction. That's sort of the, what I want to work to in this slide. And you've seen this before. This is just very high level. Um, and there's lots of different schemes that allow you to do this. I think it, really started with Sirac and Zoller, and there have been many improvements since then. They involve a spin-dependent um, uh, optical dipole force. It doesn't have to be optical, but um, it's very hard to focus microwaves on individual lines, so we use optics. The idea is if we can apply a force, sort of like with optical tweezers that push the atom, uh, depending on its spin state, there are four possibilities of these two spins, if you want to, say, entangle just these two. Up, up, and down, down, they both move the same. So this force, sorry, this force, say, would push up if you're in state, spin up, down if you're in state, spin down. Um, and again, selection rules and the geometry of the lasers tell you how that works. Um, and uh, if, if you consider the four possibilities of these two, of these two spins, um, when they're in the same state, their Coulomb interaction, just these two, their Coulomb interaction is the same, but if they're in opposite states, they're a little further apart, and so you get an effective, you get an effective dipole, dipole interaction between them, okay? So if you uh, look at, and by the way, these effective dipole moments are much bigger than any Rydberg atom could hope for. And it's because we're moving a whole charge many nanometers, okay? So the induced dipole moments uh, can be huge. So if you look at these four states, the middle guys feel this energy defect, um, and when that phase is pi over two, uh, it's pi over two or four, I forget. I think it's pi over two. Um, uh, then this is equivalent to a C naught gate and a fully entangling gate in a different basis. Okay? And again, this is really the idea of Molmer and Sorensen and, and others, the idea of a spin dependent force. Um, a few things that make this story very easy. Number one, um, we actually, um, because we're in a clock basis, we don't use this gate. We do it in the X basis instead of the Z basis because the great thing about clock states is they don't have. Uh, you know, this, it's, it's very hard to get a Z term in Hamiltonian. So we actually do it in the X basis, but the physics is identical. Um, and so this is a native interaction. When you do this, it's an icing interaction, and you can apply it for a certain amount of time. This is a typical time. Uh, some labs are different. It depends on the mass of the ion and so forth. And depending on your system, it can be pretty decent fidelity. High 90s is not hard to do these days. Okay, the other sleight of hand here is that you've probably wondered about the other ions. If you, if you push around certain ions, of course, they all know about it. And that's tricky. Of course it is. If you do this operation really fast, then this is, this is, this is actually a very good approximation to exactly what happens. If you push the atom and bring it back before, uh, uh, faster than any of the, uh, the, the, the emotional period of these collective modes, then, then this is almost an exact treatment. But in fact, we don't do that because the emotional frequencies are in the megahertz range, and we're much slower than one over a megahertz. So we're coupling to all these normal modes, which sounds like a mess. Um, and this is a sideband spectrum of 32 um, ions in a chain along the two transverse modes. And the red and blue are where we expect these modes to be, and we can identify every one of these lines. There's 64 of them. So these are the uh, upper, the blue sidebands in both x and y directions. And it, it's sort of a mess. Well, it's more than, it is a mess. And if you want to apply this laser force, you have to worry about coupling to all these modes. Now, the good news is, and this is a little bit of a surprise, um, when, we, when we want to entangle a pair, we don't, it turns out we don't have to, we don't have to deal with all those modes. And, and the trick here is that these are normal modes, but if your laser is tuned, say, right here, you know, in between these two modes, you really only have to deal with the, the, the modes that are nearby. Uh, and in, in practice, we think of a, an, another basis called local modes instead of normal modes. 
Um, it's not a physical basis. A, a, a local mode is when one ion moves and all the others are at rest. It's not. It's, it's a valid basis, of course, but it's not. These aren't uh, modes that have unique where, where every ion has the same frequency. Um, and we've learned pretty recently that we can uh, laser pulse shape, uh, and then that's the trick. We can we can apply laser pulse shapes that this this optical dipole force is not constant, but we we modulate it in a certain way that we know that all these local modes can be decoupled at the end of the day, or normal modes if you want. So this is an example of 15 ions where um, we've we've um, it doesn't say where it's tuned. Um, it's uh, with these 15 modes. And the next slide shows that with these 15 modes, we tune the laser somewhere. And by pre-calculating, this is all a classical calculation on a, on a regular computer. We amplitude modulate the pulse in time. Let's see. One of these is phase. Sorry, this is a, this is a frequency modulation. So we're actually tuning through sideband, and simultaneously, this is the, the amplitude of the pulse shape. It looks pretty complicated. Um, and we have classical code that does this, and there are not that many degrees of freedom in there. There are several sinusoids in there, and just a few steps there. Um, and of the 15 normal modes, we see most of the, most of the action in the rotating frame is in a few modes. The others, they're not exactly zero, but there's, there, if you're willing to accept a 10 to the minus 4 error, the, the, the upshot here is that you don't need really complicated pulses to do this. And um, what's, what, what we've learned theoretically is that you could have infinitely many ions and this still works. As long as you're willing to admit a small error, you know, parts per million or 10 parts per million. Chris, this is well, for two out of the 15? Yeah, th in this example, sorry, this slide's probably in the wrong order. Um, th uh, out of the 15 ions, we hit exactly six and 10 <coughs> with individually addressed beams. And here are the red and blue side bands of those 15 transverse modes in one direction. And we actually tuned right here. Uh, you can ask me later why we picked that uh, position. But depending on where we tune, we, we, this was a pure AM pulse, actually. Um, and it doesn't look like it, but there are actually 15 different kind of levels here. Uh, forget about these. These are analysis pulses on the carrier later. Um, and this, this, uh, this was the calculated pulse shape that, on theory, should give us more than three nines of fidelity. And in practice, it was OK. It was in the high 90s, um, including uh, spam. Errors and there are some spam errors here because we're focusing down on a few ions that are, you know, these ions are only a few microns apart. Um, right. So uh, th this data was uh, performed. Oh, by the way, I'll point out this this uh, recent Fizzer of A that sort of talks about this, the scaling on how we can extend this to infinitely many ions and not have to worry about the complex, the classical complexity of laser pulses. So it was kind of an interesting, I didn't really anticipate this. I, I thought somehow we'd have to stop. Now we're going to have to stop for other reasons, like it's very hard to have a million ions in one chain. Um, but it won't be because of uh, all the normal modes. So that, that yeah, is there a comment? Uh, yeah. Chris, so when you have done a long chain and you want to gain between distant ions, do, is there some oh, scaling? Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm glad you said that because um, when, when we do couple to the normal modes, the good news is, this dipole thing goes away because we're, we're basically coupling to all the ions, all the normal modes, uh, all the local modes connecting uh, between the two ions. But the price you pay is that there is locality now. And in our case, we have exactly 32 laser beams. <laughs> so we, we expect we can do a fully connected 32 uh, between any, any of the whatever, 500 pairs of 32, but not beyond that. So if we had a 1,000 ion chain, well, we only have 32 laser beams. Um, now, if we had 200 laser beams, in principle, um, the, the gates get slower. That, that's basically what you're going to find. Yeah. Do you know what the how how the, what the, the power? Is? No. I guess it's a power law. <laughs> no, it's it's uh, you know I I don't know I have to say my intuition fails me on some of this stuff. <laughs> um, it, uh, but we find that with you know up to 20 or 30 ions, that the solutions don't need any more laser power, or they don't they don't take any more time. Seems a little weird to me, but somehow there has to be a slowdown over. And I, I think one way to think about that is you have 32 ions, you're using every mode, you're using all these modes to mediate the interaction. So even though you're adding uh, more spins and more mass, you're also adding more more of the modes to, 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 to help get them entangled. Yeah. It's hard to scale when we're talking about like between 10 and 30. It, it's, it's hard to get scaling laws there. But. I think in practice, in any case, we don't want hundreds of laser beams. <laughs> so, so 
to, to me, that's going to be the limit on, on the connectivity. It's going to you know, be, be local 30 or 40 or something like that. So this, the, the, this data was performed on our, our, our so-called Eureka system. This is our IOPER program uh, funding uh, the, the system. And again, the laser and all of the coherent optics are inside this black box, which makes it perform a lot better than any of our other apparatus. And of course, one of these HOAs is inside that trap. And what's made this possible was the, the interactions with coherent, I already mentioned that. Um, I don't usually talk about that, but modification of that laser. Harris makes this 32 channel AOM for us and, and some of the uh, input and output coupling optics to that thing. We don't have a cold quanta vacuum chamber in here, but we're, uh, Jung Sang Kim at Duke has probably done, he's done a lot more than we have on miniaturizing the vacuum chambers. They now have a vacuum chamber that's just a few cubic inches in the, in the low 11s uh, for their ion trap, which is kind of cool. They make the vacuum seal right on the chip itself. AOSense makes very nice CW lasers that are fiber coupled uh, for, for this effort. <clears throat> so uh, when we, uh, before we built this system, we had another uh, uh, system that was not as, not as in well integrated. Um, and this was several years ago, four or five years ago that we started that. Um, and and uh, it, it was the first experiment where we used this 32 channel AOM. Now we only had 10 laser beams going through it. And the ion trap was a blade trap that one of the electrodes broke. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we could only use some of the electrodes. We could only trap up to about seven or nine ions. Uh, but when we did that, what was interesting is our, our, our research um, took a little bit of a different direction, much higher level. And I like to say when we, when we put that together, it was almost like a user facility. We, we got calls from everybody that was using the IBM system. They had five qubits at the time in 2016 or 2017 but they could only do a few operations before everything kind of died. And so they would call us, and now we didn't have our system on the cloud, but we had graduate students that could tune up the system and then run all afternoon for several hours without knowing that they're actually controlling atoms and so forth. So the idea is to calculate these pulse shapes and then run algorithms at a very high level. Now the tricky thing with our interactions with external people is that they're used to C knots and Hadamard gates. Well, we don't have those. We have icing gates, XX gates and rotations. And um, these XX gates, what I'll, I'll maybe mention this later, what's interesting about the icing gate is that they're very expressive because they have a continuous parameter. You can apply the icing gate for any amount of time you want. The C not gate doesn't have that. Um, and this, this makes this, uh, this, this, uh, this particular type gate uh, uh, very useful for you know, compiling uh, a high level algorithm into something we can run. I, I, obviously, I'm not going to talk about many of these things. Um, a few notes, actually, uh, Alexei will talk about um, a recent experiment. Well, he'll talk about the theory behind it, I think, uh, well, it's published right here, on uh, simulating quasi-particle confinement in these strongly coupled spin chains. We'll talk about that, I mean, tomorrow. is that tomorrow or yeah. Yeah, tomorrow? Uh, but I, I, I do want to talk about a few of these uh, experiments, one in particular that um, Benny Yoshida at Perimeter and Norm Yao at Berkeley brought to our attention. And this, is, this uh, ha has to do with a concept called scrambling, quantum scrambling. You've probably heard about this. Um, well, I hadn't heard about it until they, they, uh, they told me about it. Um, and John Bollinger will talk a little bit about these out-of-time order correlators that are quite related. But scrambling, uh, to me, is sort of like an extension of entanglement that has, that has infinite depth in a system. So it's not only entangled, but it's entangled at all depths. Um, and it's, it's a tricky concept to tease out of a unitary. How do you know that a unitary scrambles or not? And these guys, uh, Yao and Yoshida, showed how uh, you could make a quantum circuit as a litmus test for a unitary that scrambles. And uh, of course, scrambling is related to some of these theories on how quantum information would, would fare in a black hole if you have one half of an entangled pair and you put the other in a black hole. And apparently, that the, the, the one you put into the black hole gets scrambled quickly with the rest of the system in the black hole. Because the black hole is closed, the, you, th you can think you can model it as a unitary, which bothers me a little bit because black holes are usually pretty massive, not really quantum at all. But if you correlate the Hawking radiation from a black hole with the with the particle you left kept behind, there is some information that you can obtain out of there. So that, that's sort of the interest. And uh, Hayden and Preskill and also Lenny Suskin uh, looked at this uh, a while ago. But here, here's the idea. It's very sort of simple. Um, it's a seven qubit circuit. Um, and these two, uni this unitary and its inverse, are supposed to be the, the, the system that you're um, trying to test whether it scrambles or not. And so you have to implement this 
this U and its inverse. And this is a minimal version, three qubits. You need at least three qubits to show scrambling. Because with only two qubits, if it's entangled, it's scrambled. It's the same thing. But with three or more, they can be different. Um, so in this case, this is a pretty small version of the black hole, if you want, three qubits. <laughs> a, little, a little goofy there. But the, the idea behind this circuit is pretty cool. And um, it's very hard to see this at first glance. But you can see there's, there's uh, the qubits are entangled in a certain way. And all except the first qubit are initialized in zero. And the first qubit is prepared in some arbitrary state. And of course, we're going to play with the state. We're going to have many different states there. Uh, and the idea is post-selected on any one of these pairs um, as being measured in a Bell state. Um, if that state gets teleported here, then U scrambles. To me, that was sort of amazing just seeing that. Um, and you can go through the math, and, and it's, it's, pr it's pretty fancy to see that that's the case. Um, and you can also make it not post-selected by doing putting a, a sort of a, a post-circuit, a Grover search circuit here that finds which one of the bell pairs uh, heralds that, that teleportation. But the cool thing here, as opposed to an out-of-time order correlator, is that if you and you dagger are not exactly inverses, or there's decoherence here, it's not reflected in a lack of um, uh, uh, teleportation fidelity. It's reflected in a smaller yield of this bell state being measured. So you can separate the effects of decoherence from the real scrambling stuff. Now, for the unitary, we chose this one, which I don't, don't look at it too, too hard, but there is a continuous parameter theta in here. And when theta is 0, there's no scrambling in this unitary. We know this. And when theta is pi over 2, there's maximal scrambling in this 3 qubit unitary. And so the data here it doesn't look too impressive at first. When we vary theta from 0 to pi over 2, um, uh, we find that indeed the teleportation fidelity, um, it's, it's averaged over some, some uh, representative sample of states. Uh, it does start at 0.5, which is consistent with 0 fidelity in terms of and there's no teleportation if it's 0.5, and it grows. Now, it's not, it doesn't go all the way to 100% because they're, they're a, Hell of a lot of gates in the circuit. There's seven qubits and you know 50 or 60 gates. So these gates are each 99, 98 percent. So we expect there's some noise there, and indeed it's reflected in imperfect uh, teleportation fidelity. Okay, so that's that's a circuit. Um, you know, re recently I guess we'll lower our sights. This is an experiment, just four qubits, um, and and here uh, we we recognize that by applying a certain set of uh, quantum gates with continuous parameters in them, we can make any state we want. Uh, for instance, with four qubits, th this is um, an example that's sometimes called generative modeling. We want to uh, 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 we want to generate a certain pattern, and and this you know th this analogy to, to to making patterns is a little artificial. But with four qubits, there's 16 possible states, and when you represent it this way. Uh, uh, the ones that have a bar or stripe symmetry are circled, and let's say you want to make an entangled state of these six, these six, uh, these six states. You don't have to think about um, the patterns if you don't want, but we should be able to make that entangled state with a deep enough circuit, right? If we have a universal quantum computer, and so uh, with four qubits, we of course have full connectivity. We can do an icing gate between any pair here, or we can do icing gates between reduced numbers of pairs just to sort of test how important connectivity is. And so we, we applied um, with a fully connected or a, uh, a star connected type uh, gate structure, uh, we applied single qubit gates and a layer of entangling gates. And each one of these boxes has a continuous parameter in it. And the question is, what are those continuous parameters to make the target state? Now this one should be universal. We should only need to do one layer and we can make anything. We just need to know what those I guess 14 parameters are. This one, we might expect we have to apply it multiple times because it's not fully connected. So you probably can't make every state. Okay, so again, this is, this is a pretty small experiment, but it's the first example of doing uh, a classical optimization to make a particular state. And this actually is very similar to what we, what we now use in so-called quantum approximate, approximate optimization algorithms and also variational quantum uh, eigensolvers, where we vary parameters to make a certain target state. So uh, this is, some, some people, the buzzword here is the hybrid quantum classical uh, 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 loop here, uh, where we optimize over the classical parameters in order to make a certain state. So we, 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 we make a guess at the parameters, uh, 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 
make a measurement of the quantum state and how well did it, uh, how well did we make the target state we wanted to, some, form some figure of merit, and then do some classical optimization to, to, to have the circuit so-called learn uh, what, what to, how, how to make the state we want. And there are many different, uh, you know, none of us are experts here on the classical optimization routine, um, but uh, there, there, there are some brute force approaches. This one, particle swarm optimization, you may have heard of it, where you pick random uh, points of these, of these parameters and then let them, let them run around and, and you know, do a gradient descent type algorithm. And here, let's see, this takes a little explaining. <coughs> um, on the left here, this DKL is the figure of merit. If it's zero, that means there's zero distance between the target state and the measured state, so we want to be at zero. And we start, we start kind of high, and let's see, the, the, the orange and the orange band are, are theory, and there's a band because we have to do some kind of Monte Carlo sampling over, over this part of the initial distribution of the particle swarm. And the blue is data. Lots and lots of circuits here. This data took a long time to take, even though there's only four qubits. Now, the leftmost is one layer of fully connected <coughs> circuitry. Uh, B here is one layer, the rotations and the entanglement, one layer of a star connection, and then two layers of star connection. And you can see that the, the, the fully connected layer, it does okay. In other words, the data does converge somewhere, somewhere close to zero. It's not perfect. Um, this one, as expected, does not converge, nor does it theoretically, because we only have star connectivity and there's not enough, well, yeah, there's not enough connectivity to make the state we want. But after two, um, after two runs, uh, the simulation does quite a bit better in theory, but the experiment doesn't. Why? Well, in this case, we're limited by the, the, um, the optimizer itself. Is, is, is taking uh, it's just too much computer time. And maybe it does, you know, uh, sorry, I, I got this completely backwards. The, the experiment, uh, the gates aren't perfect. And there's lots and lots of gates here. Uh, and we have to take this data over a long time. And there's drifts, probably an experiment, that are responsible for most of it. You know, even the theory doesn't, it's not so great either. I don't quite understand that. Chris. Yeah. The distance is between populations, or it's distance between states, including um, it's, the coherence. It's sort of a variance between. It's almost like an inner dot product of these two. That, that's what the figure of merit is. That's just populations, right? That's not. It's that's not right. The, that's right. Yeah. So it's not necessarily entangled. There's, um, there's no, no. There's no necessarily coherence between these states. We don't measure it. No. Yeah. Sort of in the spirit of a quantum algorithm. I mean, if you have it, if you factor a number, you get an answer. Was it coherent or not? <laughs> Who cares if you got an answer? Yeah, we, we, we certainly know individually the gates have a very high fidelity, and you know, unless somehow when we run this experiment, particularly there's a noise source that turns on, not too concerned about that. So uh, a Bayesian optimization uh, was a little more efficient, and there's no more distribution here because uh, we can use use the, the the previous circuit to sort of inform what the next circuit should be, what the parameter should be, and we actually use, I don't have a quote here, we use commercial hardware, uh, software to do this. Um, and here it performed much better, uh, for instance, on the two layers of the star connected circuit. Um, it converged quite a bit faster. You'll note that you know, the number of circuits there is over a thousand. And here, this is not the layers uh, of, of, of each run, it's the number of uh, circuits, the number of iterations in a way. Um, and this, this sort of made, made a little more sense. And, and in this case, uh, this is what I got wrong before, in this case we're totally limited by the classical computing power here. It's only four qubits. And we're limited by um, the, uh, it takes a long time to, to run these classical optimizers. You know, I, I just wanted to put that up there because the quantum system is really simple. It's just four qubits. And these optimization routines are, are really tricky still. Uh, continuing in that vein, boy, I'm right the time here. Um, Continuing in that vein, this is a this is a, a, a simple circuit of seven qubits, where we sort of have a ring of two two qubit icing interactions, um, and we're, we can make particular states. You know, I'm going to just skip through this. Here, this was a critical uh, uh, state in the transverse icing model. Given the range of our sorry, this is infinite range interactions because we have sort of a ring here, um, and when g is equal to one, it's it's the it's the uh, uh, critical value where we expect the ground state uh, to, to be right at the critical point of this phase transition between ferromagnetism and, uh, and, uh, and anti-ferromagnetic order. 
And I guess the, the take home message here is that we know that the ground state should be minus 8.8 .8 in natural units up there. Um, and we should be able to reach it with three layers of the circuit. So the entangling and then a rotation. And there's only two parameters. How much do you do the icing gate? How much do you rotate them? It's only two parameters, so it's a little easier. And um, even after, after one layer, we got pretty close. We wanted to get to minus 8.8, .8, which is the bottom line here. But then with two layers, it got even worse. <laughs> So uh, it's a little bit, I, I think it's kind of bad news in a sense here, in terms of trying to use this, this so-called QAOA approach to, to finding uh, a target ground state. Now, yeah, I, I won't talk about this at all. This is a diff it's pretty much the same experiment, but we're generating something called a thermal field double state, which is, again, of interest in cosmology, actually. It's an interest, it's actually, I haven't seen this before, but that state, the pure state of two systems, when you trace over one system, the other one's in a thermal state. <coughs> But it's a pure system overall. So people uh, use this, again, in black hole physics sometimes. All right, I won't get into that because I wanted to talk a little bit about um, not gates between individual pairs, but global interactions between lots of ions. Uh, the physics is exactly the same, only now it's actually easier, the system, because we don't have to individually address the ions with a laser beam. And in this case, when we, the, in the usual Molmer uh, type uh, type arrangement when we apply both red and blue sidebands, they're detuned. You can see the Hamiltonians in the Landicki limit there. When you add those two together in the Landicki limit, uh, you get a spin dependent force. You can clearly see that just from adding those two blue equations up there. Um, and it's a harmonic Hamiltonian, it's a C tune. And so when you evaluate the evolution of this harmonic Hamiltonian, you get uh, an effective secular Hamiltonian that's a pure spin spin model. You can see this from the Magnus expansion of this, um, or if you want, um, you can think of it as adiabatically eliminating the phonons because you're sufficiently far detuned that you're not really exciting any of the phonons, which is nice because you don't have any A's and A daggers. It's a pure spin model. So we have this icing model, but it's fully coupled between all spins. And this formula, many of you have seen this, it, it, uh, this, this uh, icing interaction scaled by the recoil frequency and the overall Rabi frequency, but it has the normal modes uh, of, of uh, the contribution of each ion I to normal mode M, um, a product of those in this Lorentzian denominator, which we're, we're applying an off-resonant uh, force to a harmonic system. <clears throat> and these, these numerators, the numerator here sort of makes sense because the icing interaction between I and J requires that both I and J have a common contribution to normal mode M. You have to sum over all those normal modes, okay? If you want a transverse field, it's very easy. Just add a carrier. <laughs> and this would allow you to have a, a field along Y or X. This would be the Y field with no phase, but if you put a high or two phase shift, you get an X field. You can also get a Z field by, uh, by making the two sidebands uh, off balance detuned. Uh, so we have a lot of control here. Uh, uh, the icing interaction, we usually talk about it in the X direction, just for convention, and then we can apply a field along any direction of the block sphere. Um, now, this is a complicated formula, but it's a decent approximation that this reduces to an inverse power law, where uh, we have a, a nearest neighbor icing interaction, typically a, a few hundred hertz up to a kilohertz. And the, in, the power law and the denominator here, in principle, can vary between all on all, zero, or dipolar, three. And this is date. Sorry, this is theory, uh, just sort of simulating a linear chain. Um, what happens as you detune further and further away from the upper side, upper and lower sidebands symmetrically? You see this power law follows that. And um, John's going to show s similar stuff in, in, in his two-dimensional penning trap. This is d data from a paper a few years ago, showing the same thing. For different detunings, you get a bigger power law. When you're really far detuned from all of them, it, it's not quite dipolar, but you see this fall, uh, fast fall off with distance. Um, and of course, with the pitting trap, you get lots of lo lots more spin, and, and John will talk more about that. Most of the data I'll show uh, comes from a, a, I call it our legacy experiment. It's been under vacuum for 10 years now. <laughs> We've just gotten better and better at, at uh, storing large chains. We can routinely deal with about 30, and in some cases, 50 to 60 in this room temperature apparatus. It's, it's a three-layer linear trap. The first experiments long ago were adiabatic uh, uh, um, manipulations to find ground states of, of this icing Hamilton. The idea is to, to turn J off and, and prepare the spins anti-polarized uh, uh, with a Y field 
which is the ground state, and then adiabatically lower B over J, and hopefully you're in the ground state of this more interesting ordered Hamilton function. You've seen this data before. This is a direct image of anti magnetic ground states of exactly 14 spins. Um, now, it's not exactly the ground state either. We see a lot, we, we, don't, we only get one of these states a few percent of the time. Um, and the other, whatever, the other 16,000 states um, are 98 or 96% of the population. And this is, of course, because we weren't slow enough. We were not adiabatic. With the AFM ground state, the gaps are really small, and it's very hard to be adiabatic. Um, so, well, quantum computing, that would be an error, kind of a killer. And in quantum simulation, it's an opportunity, it's richness. <laughs> Actually, the, there's some truth to that because the dynamical studies of these systems are probably more interesting than the ground state studies anyway. Because the dynamics in these, these many body systems are much harder to calculate. So, we and others have gone through a whole kind of a, 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 a plethora of different experiments that are, sh that, are, that are showing these dynamical processes. One in particular I want to to, to, well, two. This is a this is a very simple one, actually. A phenomenon called pre-thermalization, which is a little weird. What does it mean to be pre-thermal? Well, we have these long-range icing interactions. In fact, I've added another term here. This is a, an XY interaction. I won't tell you how we do this, but um, uh, uh, that that Hamiltonian is interesting because it preserves the number of excitations in the system. It's a flip-flop Hamiltonian. It conserves the total number of say spin up. So, so uh, this is, I think, 22 spins. If we prepare an initial state of just one spin up and all the others spin down and let it evolve for what we call a long time, nearest neighbor coupling times T is about 30, 30 or 40, um, each picture here has only one excitation, and this is a distribution after about 1,000 averages. The excitation barely moved, but we expect the thermal value to be a probability of 1 out of 22 for each of these positions. Now, clearly the excitation sampled everything, but it barely moved. And if you look at the raw data in blue here, the center of the excitation started out on the left. That would be all the way on the right. We, it should end up right in the middle on average. And it sort of, it sort of uh, stops here. It stops evolving. Now, unfortunately, we couldn't go out more than 36. We'd love to go out to 3,600. We expect this to actually come up to zero at really long times. Now, if you look at the energy gaps in this Hamiltonian, it's a long-range Hamiltonian, very long-range. Um, there's always a pair of energies near the ground state that are really close together. And my naive view of this pre-thermalization is that it takes a long time for that energy gap to be noticed. That's one way to think about it. So this, this, uh, this pre-thermalization time is given by sort of the average energy gap. And the true thermalization time will be given by this. Okay? So our first example of stopping thermalization. Uh, another experiment from uh, about a year ago uh, was something, again, a little strange, called a dynamical phase transition. And how you can do this, it's a little strange. We have a transverse icing model in this case. And the idea is when we quench, um, prepare all the spins along X and turn on this Hamiltonian, just turn it on quickly, um, there's a competition between the precession along the Z direction independently and the ordering along X. And a very simple measurement along X, at the end we can measure the n by the uh, magnetization, that's just the brightness of all the, of, of, of all the spins. Spin up is bright, spin down is dark, and um, I don't want to dwell on this data too much, but when B is smaller than J, we sort of see not too much evolution happening, but when B is much bigger than J, the spins sort of precess around the B field. And you know, this dynamics is quite a bit different than that. I wouldn't say there's a phase transition anywhere in here, but there's certainly different types of evolution. So if we look at the correlated correlator, two-body correlator, average over all pairs, uh, this time we're plotting <coughs> that correlator versus B over J, we sort of see a dip, and it gets a little stronger as we add spins. Again, I wouldn't call that a phase transition. When we go to infinite, uh, infinite number of spins, this becomes a logarithmic divergence, uh, but we're not nearly infinite. And th this was really disappointing, actually, that you know, we went all the way up beyond 50, and we still didn't see a very sharp dip. So then we measured an n-body correlator, and in this case, it's a very weird order parameter, the, the size of the largest domain. Um, and in that case, we did see a fairly sharp kink. The size of the largest domain versus B over J. And I guess the take home point is that we couldn't really, we couldn't calculate where that was beforehand because it's too complicated. The Hilbert space is way too big. And since I'm way out of time, I wanted to very briefly um, uh, tell you a little bit about the systems at IQ that are based on uh, the one system we have at the university. This is system one, system two, and three. 
Uh, and system two, in fact, ran a, a water simulation. I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you in a minute, but this is a real time kind of uh, 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 with the way we load the ions. We load them to the slot over here, and one by one, we shuttle and merge with the existing chain. We just type in a number of ions that we want, and then under a minute, we have the ions that we need. Of course, they're zigzag and out of focus, but once we get the number we need, and the, uh, the camera recognizes it, we can then focus in and then, then do our algorithms. Um, this is all theory. In fact, I, uh, I am running out of time. You can look at this paper if, if you're interested. The water molecule is something we do know the binding energy of. It's minus 75 and change, hard trees. Um, but if you look at the classic VQE algorithm, the number of qubits and the number of gates you need to get a certain accuracy, I've subtracted that 75 hard trees off, and this orange line, orange, uh, um, fuzz is about KT, so you need to get sort of within this orange fuzz. So at about 15, you hit diminishing returns. So that means you need 10 qubits and about 650 gates. Most of those are two qubit gates. Um, now, without doing any experiment yet, this is all theory, we, we compiled it down to 10 qubits and 140 gates. And this is because the icing gate is more expressive than the C naught gate, and that's, that's the point. Um, and we haven't, uh, we haven't gone all the way down here yet, um, but we, we are certainly capable of doing that. Most of these gates are actually small angle icing gates. And we're very good at small angle icing gates. The errors are very low there. And so this is, again, uh, one of your sites a little bit, we're sort of marching down on one of our systems here. We've only gone through a few orders in, in that, but the important thing is both the statistical and systematic error bars here are not too bad as we march our way down, and they're not too far away from this chemical accuracy that you need. Now I'm going to plot this again on the, the same data, but I'm going to plot it on a different scale so I can compare it to what else is out there. <laughs> These are mostly superconducting experiments that have uh, been simulating a much simpler molecule in water even. And there are two things. Their air bars are enormous due to systematic effects, we believe, uh, but they're also not converging. And these VQEs, you need, you need the lower order terms to get the next order term. If it's not converging, there's no... Um, <laughs> It's pretty obvious why they decided not to go to three, because this is so far away from where they expect. Again, it just points to gate fidelity, and I think in these ion systems, we have much higher gate fidelity, much longer gate depth to do these uh, uh, type problems. Uh, so that's all I have. Uh, this is a picture of the group, uh, the academic group at Maryland. Um, I did spend a good part of the last year running INQ as CEO, but I'm glad to say I'm no longer in that role. <laughs> Back to my real life, and we have a professional fellow, Peter Chapman, uh, run, running INQ, but they're just down the road, about 40 people. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. We already had a few questions during the talk, so maybe there's one burning one from John. <laughs> well, so, uh, in, in, in the first part of your talk, you talked about, I think, a, at how many ions? Seven, and it was the QAOA, and you were trying to find the ground state of yeah. the transfer sizing at the critical point. And you did a second iteration, and it got worse, and say, so oh, this, this looks bad. And then the message I get with the water molecule, which, okay, it's a different problem, but it's variational quantum simulation. Things, uh, things look okay. So what, what's, what's the message I should take? Uh, yeah, boy, I haven't been asked. That's a really good one. Um, I think one is that I don't think there is a single instance where QOA has been proven to do something useful or interesting or relevant. <laughs> really? But QAOA is a. But I think of QAOA as one example of a variational. You know, you're trying to find the ground state energy of this Hamiltonian. Except the, in the variational eigensolver for chemistry, we have very good initial guesses. They're based on you know, uh, based on classical Hartree Fock mean field theory approaches to these orbitals. So we start in a very good place. Um, and we're pretty sure that we're near the global minimum already. That's the way I see it. In QAOA, you're out, you know, you're out to launch. You have to start somewhere random. And there could be many uh, you know, local minima that you don't reach. Yeah, it, I, QAOA is very speculative. Uh, you know, it's not clear to me, you know, I'll say it in this room, it's not clear to me that's going in QAOA. The VQE is more driven by chemistry and physics already. It's not a, it's not a generic optimization problem. It's a physics optimization problem. So my understanding is that's why it, there is some hope. Although it doesn't scale, it's not, it doesn't scale exponentially, but it scales with a pretty high power of the number of qubits. So water is simple, but something like caffeine, I think, 
that molecule is going to be. Yeah, we need we need some other approaches to think about that. Excellent. I need to continue to talk about what you doing the break then. I guess you guys are thinking a lot of times. Just move on. Thank you very much.